start recording. So, whew. <laughs> um, hello, and uh, it's time for the recording of the instructions to lab six. Um, most of you actually have by now the boxes, so most of you should be able to try these out at home then later. Um, it's not don't try this at home, it's try this at home. And those of you who haven't gotten the box yet, I will send you out, send you a message later. Um, there is a chance I'm available in my office tomorrow afternoon. And then on Wednesday, when we don't have a session, whenever that is, I haven't looked that far in my schedule yet. Um, I'm just checking, I'm recording with audio on, that's also good. So then, uh, yes, so today's lab exercise is all about serial communications. And originally I had three description projects in the lab instructions, but uh, then I sat down and I concentrated on two for today. Um, there are still other things which you could try on your own and do later as well. Um, and uh, yes, let's see how far we get. And perhaps there's room over for, for you suggesting some modifications to these experiments. And uh, let me try something else. For now, let me try to focus the camera here. Um, I also some of you might have seen how I <coughs> cleaned up my desk uh, just before we started. Uh, it was extremely cluttered. It still is extremely cluttered. I also had to install a bright lamp here because I have another lab tomorrow on my desk with a solar cell. But today we are here. Today we are here. Today I will focus on focusing and that was not what I wanted. Um, give it an escape. I want to have this one. Well, I would say that's almost focused. I could go a little bit uh, deeper here. Yeah, something like this. And this is about as focused as it gets and it's within the marked limits of my desk. So let's do an escape on this one. And uh, so, yes, let's start. Um, we have our board here and the very first things what we, which I want to show you is the use of the I2C bus. And so we have S clock and S data over here. Um, these are the two. These are the two signals uh, or the two wires which we will connect. And so the clock is a clock signal for the synchronous data transmission on this bus. And SDA is the data either going from the peripheral to the chip or from the chip to the peripheral. And this is controlled by the master, by the microcontroller and by the protocol. So the first thing which, which I will connect is actually this board here, which is an, a timer, a, or let's say it's, it's more than a timer. It's a real time clock. We have the timers built in into our microcontroller. They can be used for timekeeping, but only as long as our microcontroller has power. The small board here has a three volt battery. So in order to do this, you have to take out the three volt battery from its package and actually put it into the battery holder. And uh, then on the other side, we have two chips. And this is the real time clock chip, a DS1307. And this is a serial EE problem, which I will not be using today. I haven't looked up the data sheet for this. Um, I will look it up. I will put the data sheet to the collection of other data sheets, uh, which is already on Studium. 
This metal tube here, that is actually a quartz crystal. So this is essentially a quartz watch and it's the same type of crystal that you normally have inside a quartz watch as well. Uh, in the picture here you see it's given as 32.768 kilohertz. That's 2 to the power of 15 hertz. So by dividing it down in consecutive steps of 2, we could go from 32,768 first to 16,000, then to 8,192, 4,096, 2,048, 1,024, 512, 256, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2 and 1 hertz. And this is what is done inside this chip. So it's clocked down, it's divided down by steps of two until it gets down to one hertz, which is then used to count internally the number of seconds, of minutes, of hours, days of week, days in a month, months and years. It takes care of uh, leap years and it also has a, an alarm function, which we will not be using. But in order to connect it, we have to look at the, uh, at, the, at the fine print here. And there we see or not see, we see it better over here. Um, so the connector pins which you have are these four in the middle here, which are ground, VCC, SDA and SCL. And SCL is the clock signal, it connects to the SCL of our microcontroller. SDA is the data, it connects to the data pin of the microcontroller. VCC is our uh, supply voltage, 3.3 volts we will be using. And ground is the common ground, the reference, the zero volts, which we have. So what I did on the breadboard already, is I used two smaller wires here for the power supply. I, I will remove them and make it so that you can do it exactly the same way. So I have a red and a black wire here. I will use the black wire as ground and the red wire as 3.3 volts, which I have already connected here to the corresponding pins on the board. So we have, let me browse back to that page. If we look here we have our board, here we have ground and here we have plus 3.3 volts. It didn't fit in the whole text so on the board itself it says only plus 3. That's your plus 3 volt supply voltage there. And so I connected these to the plus and minus rail along the board and now I have these wires here and now I will put in this board here and then we have I can go a little bit closer. We have ground here and VCC here as shown in this diagram. Now I need to connect clock and data. And for this I use a yellow and a blue wire. And I have to scroll back because I have a very bad memory. Um, and I don't remember which one is which here. So the clock is the pin 30 and the data is the 29. So it's PD0 and PD1. PD0 is clock. I take the yellow one for that and the blue one for data. So show you what I did so far. So this is clock and this is data. And now I have to look at the fine print here and it says clock is the outer one and data is the inner one. So the yellow one goes all the way over here and the blue one goes to the one in the middle. Let me double check that this is correct. Yes. Okay, so this is how we wire up the circuit and now we have to look at the code in order to actually set the clock and read out the clock. And when the clock is first started up by inserting a battery, it will not start up and we have to do or send it a, a time information. 
And uh, this is taken care of in the example code which I have prepared. So let me go here and let me start Atmel Studio. Today I will do it with Atmel Studio again. Is this an industrial graded module? Ans as is asking. Um, industrial graded. Um, I think if you are in an industry and want to incorporate a real time clock of this type, then you would put it onto your own circuit board and not use a module like this. But uh, I've seen uh, actually in industry prototype constructions using exactly these types of modules for the first prototype which you construct. Um, so I mean it, it's not industrial graded in a way that no you don't get any guarantees from the manufacturer that it will work um, or anything like that. Uh, th these are made for the hobby market mostly and possibly as yeah, for in industry for prototype constructions. But in a real design, you probably wouldn't use a board like this. It takes too much space. If you only need this chip, uh, then you would only need to use the chip and the quartz crystal. And the quartz crystal, you probably would use a smaller form factor even. Um, so let, let me find the code which I have prepared. It should be this 2020. Yes. So we, we start a new project and uh, we call it 2020. 1123 lab 601 and I choose a chip the 32u4 and it will prepare the project for us and it will start and then it will open another window and then we go back to main.c so this is the skeleton main.c which Atmel Studio always, always provides us with. It makes some header information here and then an include for the input output definitions for our particular microcontroller and then yeah, an empty main loop essentially. But what I want to do is to use the code which I actually prepared yesterday and tested yesterday and which is available on Studium. And it's partly also copied in the lab instructions. The central parts are in the lab instructions as well. So I copy everything. I move this to the other screen. I mark everything and I paste everything. So let us see what this code does. Um, first of all, I define or I tell our compiler that we have a CPU clock frequency of 8 megahertz. Um, this I need to do because I will later use delay.h. Also, I2C master and the um, USB driver needs this information. Um, but actually in the USB driver, this is given in a different way inside the, the driver file. We have three libraries here, I2C master, mgeneral and musb.h. And these are external libraries which we have to include into our project. And for this, you will have to download these files from Studium. I can show you where I put them. Um, yeah, we can go here, we can go to modules and oops, we have lab 6 and lab 6 module is two parted. Here we have the lab 6 files and here you have links to the individual um, files which we were using today. So you just, well, you can open it inside Studium, but we saw last time that when you mark and copy them from here, then it ends up with very bad indentation. So it's better you click on download and then you save the file somewhere. I already have saved these files and they are in this directory on my 
computer. So I will actually copy the directory name into the clipboard. I will go back to Admiral Studio and I will now right click on Lab 601 up here. And then from the menu here, I will choose Add Existing Item. And then I get a file dialog here where I will go to the directory, which I just picked up. And so what do I need? I need m.general. I need the TWI master. I use the musb.h, musb.c and the i2c master.h. So this is one, two, three, four, five files. This is also described in the lab instructions. I click add and then they show up here as included files in our project. And uh, if you're using platform IO, then <laughs> yeah, then Uwe has put a nice comment here, but I didn't actually fix the correct syntax in the comment. So if you use platform IO, you will have to follow the instructions in, in the lab instructions and you have to include these files with these uh, angled brackets instead of quotation marks. I'm not sure if you could do it the same way. Possibly you could do it the same way if you compare, copy them. Oh, cop oh why, wow. My spelling was also not the best yesterday. Okay. We will have a look into this in a second. Um, here we are, I'm, I'm defining the hardware I2C address of the clock chip. And if you remember from the lecture last week on the serial interfaces, the I2C is a bus where each chip on the bus has its own 8-bit or 7-bit actually address. And you will find this address in the data sheet of the component and in our case in the data sheet of the DS1307. I can open this here. So this is a data sheet of the DS1307 and I'm not exactly sure where it says, but somewhere in this data sheet, it tells you the I2C address. It tells you how data is sent over the I2C bus and how the clock itself works, which chip or which pins the chip has. Um, Oscillator circuit, oscillator accuracy, address map. Um, no, this is just the address map. Well, it's somewhere here and the correct address for us to use in our code is 0xd0. So it's, it, it is given in the data sheet also as a hexadecimal address. Then our chip contains actually let me see if you see. Yeah, almost. Well, it, it's a bit cut off where my head is. Um, but it contains these eight registers here, which contain um, the timing information. So we have one address here where we can read out the current seconds. And then we have the minutes. Then we have hours. We have the day of the week and we have the day of the month and we have the months, we have the year and we have a control byte over here as well, which we can use to set some features of this chip. It also contains 56 bytes of freely programmable RAM, um, which we will not be using either. So if, if you're running out of RAM, you could store 56 bytes of data here. Um, well, it's, it's not much, much as you can see. The interesting thing about the way the data is stored within the chip is that it is stored in what is called binary coded decimals. And what is that? We have talked about hexadecimal code. We have talked about binary numbers. We have um, seen we are using actually uh, binary numbers, integer numbers, on, and we, we know that there are something like floating point numbers as well. If we have a byte, so eight bits of data,
then this would be bit 7 and this would be bit 0 6 5 4 3 2 1 and in binary we can store numbers from 0 to 255 in unsigned format we haven't talked so much about signed integers yet but uh, there we could also store the information as one, minus 128 to plus 127. It is a kind of offset which we introduce here in order to store negative numbers. In hexadecimal, we have seen that these numbers are stored as 0xx to uh, 0xx00 to 0xf f um, where f means 15 so in hexadecimal we are actually dividing the 8-bit number into two 4-bit numbers and then we treat this as bit 3210 and this as 3210 and with this we can actually ha we have four bits which means we have 16 combinations and these are in hexadecimal coded as 0 1 2 9 a b c d e and f so good but there is another way of dividing a byte. It's also a division into two halves, but it's called binary coded decimals. And a decimal here means a number zero, one, up to nine. So only 10 different values. And this is actually done in the exact same way as hexadecimal is done. Uh, it's just that we are not using the combinations which would be A, B, C, D, E, and F. So we are treating this as 3, 2, 1, 0. And this essentially as third, yeah, well, bit 3, 2, 1, 0. And this as 3, 2, 1, 0 but we give them values of 1, 2, 4, and 8, and 10, 20, 40, and 80. So in a byte, we now can store a two-digit number between 0 and 99. And the format is exactly compatible to hexadecimal. So 99 would be a 8 plus a 1 here. It would be 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. This is 99 in BCD. And it would also be 0x99 in hexadecimal because we are using our standard decimal digits to code the first 10 combinations in hexadecimal system as well. So if we look at the data sheet of the clock now, it says seconds, bit 3 to bit 0, and it says 10 seconds, bit 6, 5, and 4. It doesn't even use the, upper ones, uh, the, the uppermost bit because we only have to code a maximum of 59 seconds, and 5 we can actually write with 3 bits. It's the same with the minutes. We have the 10 minutes and we have the single minutes here. We have hours and tens of hours. And then it depends whether we are using a 24 or a 12 um, hour system here, whether the, we have two bits for the, um, actually this, this is exactly moved around. So the PMAM would be used in the 12 hour system and in the 24 hour system, we have two bits for the tens of hours. It's the same with the date, with the months, and also with the years. So we can have years from 0 to 99, we, have, we can have months from 0, 1 to 12, dates from 1 to 31, and weekdays from 1 to 7. Oh, I made a mistake in my code. 
I thought it was numbering, it was counting from 0 to 6. No, it's counting from 1 to 7. Okay, my bad. Um, we can correct this later. So the registers themselves I have actually defined here as something which is called enum. It's nothing else that the variable dssec will contain the number 0, dsmin will contain the number 1, dshour will contain the number 2 and so on. So this is an index, an index to the number of the registers here which makes it perhaps a bit easier to read later in the code. I'm not sure. Right now I'm not even sure if I used it. I have defined a predefined time here which is actually uh, 21 hours, 50, 35 minutes, weekday 0, date 22, months 11, year 20. Um, this was yesterday evening and this is the data which will be, will be written to our clock chip when we first power it up. And in order for this to happen, I will have to remove the battery now, eh, like this, discharge the chip for a while. Um, so right now we have not 21, we have 15, 15, 45 until we are done. It might be something like uh, 48 or something like this, 30 seconds doesn't matter. And I create a field here, an array, which will be a copy of the contents of the data from our clock chip inside the memory of the microcontroller. And then I wrote a routine here which will read the eight registers from the microcontroller. So it will transfer the data from the microcontroller into, uh, fr from the clock chip into our microcontroller, read from the clock chip. And it does so by actually using the I2C functions from the library, which we just included from the I2C master TWI master library pair. It's a library written by Peter Flurry, um, who has been active with AVR microcontrollers very long, and uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been using his his libraries uh, since I started with microcontrollers. Um, he hasn't updated his libraries lately, so actually I had to make some additions because the 80 Mega 32U4 wasn't supported yet, and. Uh, neither in this library nor in the UART library. So I made some additions to it. But actually what it does here, it goes through a loop and reads the registers from the microcontroller, uh, from the clock chip into the microcontroller. We will have a look how this looks um, as well. I wired up the oscilloscope as well. So we have a look at how the data is transferred. DS1307 write actually does the opposite. It takes the copy which we have in the memory and puts it into the micro uh, into the RTC, into the real-time clock. Here the necessary command is called I2C write, write data onto the I2C bus. And uh, here we have our init. As usual, uh, I put most of my hardware initialization into this function and uh, this contains the USB init. I want to see something on my computer as well. So we have three things now involved. We have our computer where we write the code and where we can watch what happens. We have the microcontroller who does the work and we have the real-time clock where we want to get the information from. And uh, so actually the first thing it does, it, it tries to read once from the um, real-time clock and if there is a 1 at the highest bit of the seconds register, that means that our clock is not running because someone had taken out the battery and didn't restart the clock afterwards. So in the data sheet, this is actually this bit here, bit 7 of the seconds register. And it says over here in, the, in this long paragraph, um, if bit 7 of register 0 is the clock halt bit, 
Bit 7 is a clock halt bit. When this bit is set to 1, the oscillator is disabled. When cleared to 0, the oscillator is enabled. On first application of power, the time are typically reduced. The GI is set to 1. The clock can be halted whenever timekeeping functions are not required, which minimizes current. Um, this thing can run three to five years of a standard 30, uh, 30, 20 32 um, lithium button cell battery so absolutely nothing to be afraid that it will consume too much um, power and uh, sorry Hans, i didn't see your second question how far 20 minutes ago he asked why are we not using platform io because today i want to show uh, the use of um, admit studio again it's it should be quite simple to go from one to the other and uh, today i chose admin studio so here we have an if sentence if the data in the second register and this constant hex uh, binary number here is true that means if the highest bit is set then we will actually transfer the set up data which i put here into our local copy where was i into our local copy of the registers and then i will do a ds1307 write which transfers these eight bytes from the microcontroller into the real-time clock and starts the clock at the time which i set so things which can be improved in this code things which could be added to this code later on would be a function to set the clock i mean we have a microcontroller we can make a small user interface to actually set the clock to any time given and uh, this is not provided in this short code uh, this code is simply to demonstrate the use of the i2c bus then we have our main function here and there i define some variables year month day day of week hour minute and second and i define a text string which we will be using to communicate with the pc over the usb and this time i didn't forget to include a call to the init function and uh, this means that at this point our clock should be running and then we have our infinite while loop where we check and read the data from the clock chip we actually take the data from the registers and convert it into a reasonable number which our microcontroller can handle our microcontroller doesn't have functions to handle bcd numbers binary coded decimals our microcontroller is used to handle binary numbers so we can have a look into the from bcd function in a second it's up there in the code which actually takes a bcd number and converts it to a standard binary number i do this for all the eight registers and then i convert this data into a string which is then sent over the usb to our computer then we do nothing for one tenth of a second and then we go through this routine again and again and again so sh we should have continuous activity on the i2c bus where there is new fresh data transferred from the clock chip to the microcontroller all the time and uh, let's do one more thing before we start because i found out now that actually our weekdays start at one and not at zero i defined a, an array of three character long strings here containing the weekdays monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday saturday and sunday um, completely neglecting that it starts at a one so one would be monday so in order to print this correctly i have to take the day of week number here and decrease it by one because monday is index number zero in this field as c strings are always in the or c arrays are index, always indexed from zero upward um, we would have these 
numbers corresponding to the index positions, but our clock would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instead. So I will go to where I print the weekday, which is here, and instead of D O W, day of the week, I will print it with index D O W minus one. So if we have a one for Monday, then uh, it will use index zero in this field. And hopefully this will work. We will see. So let's see if this compiles. I press compile. And uh, it didn't even give me a warning message. It just went through. Um, we will be using 3860 bytes or 11.8% of our program memory and 84 bytes or 3.3% of our data memory. So, yeah, reasonable, um, absolutely not many resources used. And uh, now we'll have to program it in a second. So I will swap you back to this camera here, where I had disconnected this because I took out the battery to actually reset the clock chip. And now I have to get the battery in here again. Click like this. And put it back into this circuit like this and I have to connect it to the USB. Ding ding dong. Here we are. Here we are and uh, now we are in some mode. I don't know which program is still running in there but in order to program our code I would have to double click the reset button but before I do that, I will prepare AVR Dudes um, by actually having a look and find the correct file. So we are in the lab 601 directory, which is a project directory. And there we find our code in this case under debug. Go here and it confirms that we have new code, which would be 3860 out of 32768 bytes. And I will double click, check whether it's, it wasn't the correct COM port, and I will program. And I have programmed. And yeah, what should happen now? Actually, now, <laughs> does the clock run? I have no idea. Um, we would see if we use our terminal program like putty or terraterm again in order to have a look at the data which comes possibly comes from our microcontroller and i put a link to terraterm as well into the description of the of the lab instructions and you can possibly see now I want a bigger font, even bigger font, give me bigger font. Where was setup, setup terminal, setup terminal. Um, no, not setup terminal. Setup window. Oh no, it's of course setup font, which I didn't see because my thick finger was in front of it. And uh, so this is it, give me 22. Okay, so here we see our clock ticking and it says it's Monday, the uh, 33rd or 23rd of November 2020 and it's uh, 1549, which is of course wrong again because it took longer time than I had estimated to get everything running. Um, so, but this is actually running. So, okay. Does it really work? How can we check whether this really works now? Um, well, for one thing, I could actually disconnect the microcontroller and you should be seeing the clock ticking up here in this small window up here and it's updating. So if I now take out the USB cable here, it will of course stop updating here because no data is sent anymore. Um, but we remember or we see that I took out the cable when the internal clock was at uh, 1550 and 32 seconds. 
and so talking a bit now perhaps half a minute has passed so we should see that it restarts at 51 and not goes go back to any other value and it was exactly 51 what, what what's the chance for that um, so I set the clock to because it was stopped before I set it when the program started for the first time to 48 minutes and 30 seconds and now we are at whatever I lost my view of it at 51 and 20 31 and so on I can also disconnect the power here and I do something else I put it here um, for let's say yeah something like 10 seconds or so or 15 seconds I talk a little bit and uh, rumble and talk what we will be do after the break after the break we will look at the spi transfer both on the oscilloscope and on a logic analyzer and then we will send data over the uart as well so now i have talked enough i think and i will put it back into the circuit and now it should definitely be around 52 or 53 minutes um, i'll connect it and we had 52 minutes and 16 seconds so it continued to run while it was completely disconnected from the microcontroller and when i put it back into the circuit it tells us what the time is and uh, with this now we take a break and i'll get my last coffee for today and uh, then i'll be back if there's any questions so far uh, also questions about um, have you have you gotten anything to run yet um, I, I'm quite curious uh, so I'll be back in a second
and mic. Mic, mic. Okay, how could I set the clock to the correct time now, which would be 16.05? Um, I will hard code 16.06 here, 16.06. And I, instead of checking whether the bit is set, I will just, when it starts for the first time, go through and really set the clock to the new time. So we go here, program. And now I will remove the comment, recompile the code, go here, program. And now what's the time? Wrong window. Correct window, 16.07. Now we are winded fast, but yeah, okay. Um, perhaps it's only half a minute, I don't know. Most probably it's only half a minute. Okay, but I will start to rig up the oscilloscope. Round. We have yellow and blue. We have blue and yellow. And we have a yellow probe. And we have a blue probe. Are these somewhat in focus? I have no idea. I don't see what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, averaging um, acquire uh, refresh one volt per centimeter. Okay, one volt per centimeter. Okay, and now some reasonable centimeters here. see anything? Why do I not see anything? Is the clock still ticking? No, the clock is not ticking. Uh, while connecting I must have interrupted something which happens sometimes. And also all the other channel one, two. Oh, this is noisy again. Source channel one coupling falling slope. And where is my trigger level? Here's my trigger level. Why is it that noisy? Where is the noise coming from? Again, it's so noisy. What is this? 100 microfarads. So this will probably, oh, I can do it like this. I disconnect this one first, then I put in this capacitor. Need to cut the legs. The time is 69 minus plus. Reconnect. It's still noisy. But 
Okay, it's not too noisy. menu then actually almost everything fits onto a single screen uh, it doesn't really fit okay doesn't matter doesn't matter because i will also prepare this one here i hear a microphone what sorry it was jag som inte hade mutat det men jag har en fråga också ja Jag tänkte bara vänta tills du var klar med den förra frågan eller vad det nu. Jag missade den förra frågan men det kändes som att du höll på med någonting. Jag vet inte om det var en förra fråga. Jag, jag höll bara på att rigga oscilloskopet så att vi kan titta på de här signalerna sen på oscilloskopet här. Men, kan jag ställa frågan nu då? Absolut. För, för, nu ställer jag bara på svenska för att jag tänkte bara fråga du om Du kan absolut också fråga på svenska. Absolut. <laughs> om jag kan komma och hämta ehm... Ja. Kittet imorgon ja. hörde jag någonting att du sa. Ja. För nu är jag frisk. Du är frisk, det är bra. Och jag har blivit testad negativ också så att jag är okay. superfrisk. Så, så du hade inte eller du har Nej. haft... Nej, jag hade inte. Nej, du hade inte. Eh, kan man ju säga det är kanske synd eller så är det bra. Jag vet inte. Um, Nej. Man, man vet inte. Men imorgon efter klockan ett... Det blir jättebra. Och jag, jag kommer skicka ut det också men jag kan berätta så... Um, Jag vet inte om du vet var jag sitter. Jag vet inte om du kommit förbi någon gång. Um, men det är hus 2, våning 1 på Ångström. Jag kommer att skicka ut det som, som information. Mm. Hus 2, våning 1 och det finns en ringklocka där utanför korridoren. Och om du bara plingar där så, så kommer jag eller någon annan att öppna och så kan du få din låda. Jag skriver det, hämta låda. <laughs> Är det någon sista tid som du är där? Eller ja, jag, 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 bru, jag brukar gå hem klockan fem. Ja, men, ja, precis. Men det är så sent. Men i alla fall där på så, eftermiddag. Så 13, till 5, nej, 13 till 17 borde jag finnas där i närheten. Och om inte så vet någon kollega var jag finns. Och så fixar vi det. Mm. Jag har en till fråga. Ni ja, absolut. Om exjobb och ja. ämnesgranskare. Ja, För att jag vill göra exjobb, eller jag har sökt ett exjobb som ligger ganska nära den här kursen, eh, tänker jag. Och ja. jag tänkte, brukar du vara ämnesgranskare? Jag, har, jag brukar ha ett antal exjobb som pågår hela tiden, det är ämnesgranskare, yes. Får man ställa sig någon form av så här, jag vill ha dig som ämnesgranskare i kö? <laughs> det, det finns ingen kö, det är bara... Eh, om det blir för många så kommer jag säga stopp, men eh, för just vår terminen har jag ingen hittills, så du skulle vara först till och med. Så, för att jag, det, jag ska dessutom börja i mars, så det är ju till och med liksom lite det är, så här... Oj, vad lugnt! <laughs> ja, ja, men för, jag är ute i god tid ja. med saker. Per, period 3 kan jag säga kommer vara lite jobbigare i år än vad det brukar vara för mig, men period 4 är lugn. Nej, inte lugn. Jag har min kurs där också som kommer från... Jag vet, vi vet inte hur undervisningen ser ut då heller. Så Nej. Jag räknar med att det fortfarande är distans. Men det är den kurs som jag har gett på distans redan en gång. Så jag har fått lite vana just för den där kursen. Så det är, då har ett år gått med den här coronaskiten. Åh <laughs> oh men gud, vad kul. För, för det, det, jag, det jag har sökt är att göra ett GUI för microcontrollers. Okej. Okay. Jag vet egentligen inte så mycket mer än... Nej. Det. Och jag kan säga att just sånt har jag varit ämnesgranskare för, förut. Så det är olika industrier här som har haft exjobbare med sådana där teman. Och det brukar alltid vara intressanta arbeten både för, för mig att läsa sen och för studenten också. Ja, det verkar vad, kul. Vad är det för företag om jag får fråga? Nitec vad heter det. Vad gör, de? vad gör de? Det är ett konsultbolag. Ah, Okej. Okay. I, men de finns i hela Sverige, men jag har sökt i Uppsala. Ja. Nej, men absolut. Det funkar bra. Mm. Okej. Okay. Um, ja, just det. Det är inte ens kvart, kvart, kvart över. Nu får man det tid kvar att slöpa in mig med kaffe. Oh. Men vad säger den där klockan? Den, den säger jag väl att det är kvart över, eller hur? Den säger att det är kvart över. För jag ställde den lite fel. Men så, så 
according to my time zone <laughs> it's, it's quarter past it will soon jump over down here now it now my other my computer also says it's quad so it's almost a minute off now um but, but the, yeah i mean just to show you the principle and uh, if i now take this camera and try to point it past everything else here onto the oscilloscope screen you can see um, the noisy signals let, let me check one thing before i show this to you perhaps i can make it a little bit nicer at least yeah it's a little bit a little bit less noisy so i will move my lamp a bit down my lamp has gotten a shade I will actually switch over. I will show you the code once more, just to make you, or, or just this window, just to make you not give, not give you motion sickness. So like this, and well, the uh, oh, and I didn't do that. I, I just said I would, but then I, I actually didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> sorry for, for motion sickness. Um, what you see here is now the sick. Uh, I can actually switch off this light. What you see here on the oscilloscope, the yellow is our clock line and the blue is our data line. And uh, what we can see is that we have some very regular pattern over here in yellow and then we have this more random pattern in blue and uh, this is because these are the individual bits which are transmitted back and forth over the i2c bus here we see a first block of two groups and then we see one two three four five six seven eight and i can promise you there is nothing hidden after the eight so they have one two three four five six seven eight there is there's nine. Oh yeah sorry it's nine blocks here yes um we can have a look in the code and see if we understand what is happening but if I point you to this region down here, you see that there's something changing regularly. All the other data is somewhat stable, but here we see that something is changing. If I try to zoom in on this particular part, um, I can also, let me see, Intensity persist. No. No, I want this intensity I want to have high. I want to, if I only could, trace grid. I make the grid a bit weaker here so then we see the data better. So, um, yes? Yep. Um, Uwe, on yes. what pins have you placed the oscilloscope probes? Uh, this is SCL and this is SDA. Oh, thanks. So, so this is really the I2C data now. And this is the second block. This is the first and second byte of the second block. The first one is our microcontroller addressing the I2C real-time clock chip and say, now, says, now I want to read data from you. And then this is the first register data from the real-time clock. This is a second and so on. So these are the seconds. And here we see how it actually increases or, or steps. Every second we get a new number back here. And this is actually our time information. The next one here is then the minutes and then comes the hours and so on. And now it passed through zero, which we should also see um, up there so there you have the on, on the last digit there you see what is happening on this byte here and so now we are at I don't know now now we jumped one one on the tens places so if I see this correctly then this this is now well I don't know what what I see here um, <laughs> without the facet okay this this is 
now we have 40. So this is bit four on the upper half. Um, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 60. And 60 is 0. So we get a 0 then back on um, the second counter. So on an oscilloscope we can see this data live and uh, we can read what how how high the voltage is on these channels. Obviously I have a times 10 probe which I didn't correct for um, but it says that this is roughly 1.6 centimeters times 2 volts. This is 3.2 volt in amplitude here and this is what we would expect from a 3 volt system. An oscilloscope like this costs around uh, 5,000, 4,000, 5,000 crowns, 400, 500 euros or dollars. Um, I want to show you a cheaper alternative, which actually is available for something like uh, around $10 on the internet and which can be used for exactly the same purpose. And this is actually let me just check the focus. Are we focused? We are focused. Okay. Um, try to escape here. It is this small box. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> this small box here. Um, there are also um, a mobile, but I, I, yeah, the, the, the thing is you still need to connect it somehow to the mobile unit. Um, but uh, inside of this box here, which you can buy for, for something, as I said, 15 uh, euros or dollars or 150 crowns, 200 crowns on the internet, there are two chips inside and one is actually an FPGA a field programmable gate array uh, which is used to actually there's three chips okay um, which is used to actually transfer the data then over the mini USB interface to the computer and uh, I will just quickly connect it in the same way it says also beep 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 and the white here should be our ground so um, oh oh no um, I need a ground pin Let's take a ground pin. Ground is here. I ground this one here. And then I actually connected, it has eight channels. So you can uh, measure on eight channels, but you cannot measure individual voltages. You are just seeing whether a signal is a one or a zero, a logical one or a zero. So it's just in uh, uh, analyzing uh, logic levels. But for our projects here, it's good enough. So I now have the black and the brown wire here, which I connect to the clock and data signal in parallel to the oscilloscope. Um, our counter is still counting. And uh, then I will start the corresponding software. What I haven't tried before is now I have everything connected to the same USB hub. Um, let's see if this will overpower my system um, or the USB connection. I don't think so. Okay, that sounded good. So this is an open source software for these uh, logic analyzers. It's called Pulse View. And there we can actually tell it to sample, to measure a couple of samples at a certain speed. So it says one mega samples now at 20 kilohertz. This is definitely too slow. So I will make it one mega samples, one million samples at one megahertz, which will then take one second to fill the whole screen. Um, since previously I have selected channel two and channel three, I will actually deselect them um, by setting up the pins. No, cancel. 
here sorry here so i want to have d0 and d1 but not d2 and not d3 and i also want to get rid of the uart for now so we say disappear to this one no okay delete so and uh, now i will start the sampling by pressing run here and let's see if something happens and uh, well something happened i caught some data so here we see data um, on d0 but i don't see anything on d1 so i must have connected something wrong over here but it says channel well it, they numbered channels one Why? Let me check if there's anything on channel three then. Or oh, two and three. Let's see all of them. And I start running again. And no, there's no data. Uh -huh. Okay. Is this channel broken let's see if i move this wire to this channel and i rerun it i'm confused oh no i'm not confused i'm stupid i'm not confused i'm stupid but that's okay don't tell anyone don't tell my students. Okay, so what I did is I connected the wire, the probe wire to the ground pin and not to the uh, clock pin here. So now let's try it again. And uh, we get rid of these two channels here, which we really don't need. I say run and we see that there's some spikes in a regular pattern and uh, if i zoom in by just using the scroll wheel here we get the same image as on the oscilloscope but without all the noise because now it's just reading whether it is a one or a zero and i tried yesterday i cannot make the traces higher it seems so we have to live with this but here we see the clock signal so this is a very regular pattern which we see down here but up here we see the, yeah, the data quite intermittent. The interesting or the good thing or the well, interesting for us, but the useful thing with this software is now that we actually can let our computer analyze I2C communication. So I select I2C from the list of an infinite number of different uh, protocols, serial data transfer protocols here. And it tells me there's no channels selected in the decoder. Uh, because I have to tell the system that the clock is on D1 and the data is on D0. And uh, I also tell it that we have unshifted data. So, and now I hope you can see it, but you have a screen copy of it already in the lab description. Here you can see this part here. This is our microcontroller sending out to the address d0 the command to write data and then our clock chip says okay i'm here i acknowledge that you want to talk to me and uh, this bit here this zero over here is actually from our clock chip and then our microcontroller sends a group of eight zeros and again our clock chip acknowledges okay i got your data um, I know what you want. I know that you now want to start reading from register zero. Then our microcontroller sends out address D1. Well, it doesn't send out address D1. It sends out address D with the read bit set. And the microcontroller, the, the clock chip says, okay, yes, let's read data. And then the clock chip sends data. So this was actually 
um, a 0, 3 which came back. So 0, 0, 0, 0 and then we had 1s over here in this area which was two logical 1s. So we were at 3 seconds past 28 minutes past 16 hours on day one weekday one on the 23rd of November in the year 20. So since we only have uh, two decimals for the year, it doesn't know that it's 2020, it could be 1920 as well. Well, 1920, these chips didn't exist. It could be 2120. Well, 2120, perhaps these chips will not exist anymore, um, but currently they exist and they tell us the date. And uh, then comes the status, the last byte as well, which doesn't contain timing information anymore but status information. So this is, and, and then we, we can see that actually, yeah, let me check. Um, so here we see the next data package and uh, we can actually measure how long it is between these different data packages by actually taking these cursors here, moving them there and there and this, it says 102 milliseconds. And where do these 102 milliseconds come from? Well, we had them in our code um, because after we have received a package, I wait for 100 milliseconds here and then I go through the same loop again. So 10 times per second, I ask the clock chip for, for the actual time. Uh, since it's only updating once per second, this is of course overkill. Um, but yeah, it's just to show you the principle. And there are other I2C peripherals which are quite interesting to be used in projects or when you do something yourself. And this is, for example, accelerometers and, uh, and a lot of other things. Um, actually, in I2C August, the, uh, the timing is fixed and it follows exactly the pattern which we saw here, which means that the data is read uh, during the falling edge of the clock signal. Or, or no, no, sorry, rising edge. It, it's rising edge. It's rising edge. Um, and this is I2C. In SPI, actually, there are two different modes available which you could choose, or actually, which you have to choose according to the periphery chip which you are talking to. Uh, there, actually, it could be on the rising or the falling edge. But on I2C, it is fixed in the standard and actually uh, even the data sheet for the clock chip has a, a diagram, had a diagram showing this. Um, this is a timing diagram for the uh, I2C. So we see the clock signal down here and we see the data signal up here. Um, I think there's even a second one further down. Yeah, here. Um, so this is actually um, the data transfer of uh, two bytes and uh, so it, it's described completely in the data sheet but in I2C there is no choice, there it is fixed. SPI, as I said, uh, would be also interesting to look at but uh, I don't have any peripherals for SPI right now which we could use. Um, I didn't have the time this weekend, I didn't take me the time this weekend to actually get this screen to run, but it's also an I2C interface uh, to it and I will during the week uh, play around with it hopefully, and, or I will play around with it and hopefully get it to run and then we can use it in the next lab together with the servo motor. So then we have UART communication and as I told you in the good old days of real labs uh, you would be connecting your system, your microcontroller to your neighbor's microcontroller and then you could send data from one microcontroller to another over a very rudimentary type of network. 
what we can do is actually we can send data to our logic analyzer and we could also send data to the oscilloscope and just have a look at how data looks in UART communication instead. So in order to do this we'll have to find out where to connect ourselves and how to send the data. So if we look at the lab instructions over here and I switch you over there then actually we see these two pins here which are called RxD and TxD. RxD1 and TxD1. This is the received data pin so date, the external data goes in to the microcontroller over this pin and when our microcontroller sends out data it sends out the data over the transmit data pin. So what I will do is I will disconnect our clock chip and I will wire up the oscilloscope and uh, logic analyzer to that's just these two pins um, which means that I will rip off this chip here. I will take out these wires. I leave everything as it is here and I move the two cables here our yellow and blue cable from d0 and d1 to d2 and d3 and now we should be sitting on the uart pins instead of the i2c pins what i also will do is actually tell the microcontroller to talk to itself by putting a wire between the receive and transmit pin so that the microcontroller will receive back the data which it sent out itself like this well I didn't show it to you so I rip out the cable again so we have the transmit data in blue and the receive data in yellow and I will take this white wire and connect the two together and if we look into the instructions we are also supposed to use a switch for our coming code. So we have this bag with small push buttons which are of a similar type to the one which is already sitting on our microcontroller board here and I will put it here and I'm looking where I wrote it doesn't matter where I wrote it but it, it's supposed to be connected to B0. I will use a green wire for this. B0 to the push buttons one side and the other side of the push button to ground. Because we can have an input pin with a pull-up resistor kept at plus 5 or plus 3 volts and then when I now press the button actually I will move the wires to the other side of the button just because I can reach better through these wires now. I can reach the double click button here the reset button under the green wire and I can reach this wire here and uh, then we can read off uh, the status of this pin. So what I will do is I will try to find my Atmel Studio. I will try to find you over here. And uh, yes, enough with this code. It, it can be absolutely in basis for, for your own experiments. And this is the meaning also with these code examples. I will remove this and I will try to find... Here we are, um, the code 2, open with programmer's notepad, Mo -mo oops. so this is a code which you will also find on Studium and we will, I will copy this code, oops, go and I will paste this code over here. So, and now we need to include a different library, so not the um, i2c libraries, which was tweemaster.c and i2cmaster.h, but I 
have the library uart which comes with the files uart.h and uart.c which are on studium in the list over here it's these two files down here and uh, i have them in the same directory where we found the previous files so actually with a bit of luck Atmel Studio remembers this so I go to existing item and I yes here we have uart.c and it's not sorted alphabetically here we have uart.h so I will add those two and they are now also in this list that twi master is still here doesn't matter um, it can stay there but let's have a look at what this code or how this code is constructed again we tell the compiler that we are running at 8 megahertz we include some standard libraries here um, i have included some more libraries than what we actually need doesn't matter um, here we have the two usb libraries again and here we now have uart.h if you are curious to see what this is you can double click and open it in the explorer window here in the editor and it defines a couple of uh, things like error messages like functions like uart in it and it gives also a uh, yeah some kind of short introduction of what these functions do and how they are used and if they have arguments uh, what the arguments are so also if you google for it or follow the link in the uh, description you will find a little a little bit more uh, of explanation or documentation in the init we have our standard usb initialization which we have seen a couple of times before because we want to send data also to this computer screen and then comes the UART init, so the Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter init, where we actually tell it to choose a certain baud rate given a certain CPU frequency. The baud rate is derived from the CPU frequency, so we have to tell this initialization routine both at which frequency our CPU is running and what the baud rate is which we want to use um, let us start with something as low as 1200 bits per second um, this is not state of the art um, 115,000 is more like state of the art but then we also have to to check which baud rates we actually could use with our given microcontroller and clock frequency i have uh, an output buffer defined here which we will see how this is used in a second and two integer variables one is called c and one is obviously something i is our standard counter name everyone uses i for counting i don't know why and when this came up but yeah i or x or y it's it's standard names for variables and here we have our infinite loop and in the infinite loop now i have this if sentence if exclamation mark parentheses pin b and one shifted pb0 yeah what what does this do it says something about unrecognized symbol well we will see it's it's not un, it's it's not undefined it just hasn't compiled it yet so pin b is the input register of port b and a one shifted to the position of pb0 is a one at the rightmost bit of our binary number and here i do a logical and be the between these two so instead i could actually have written this also as pin b and 0b1234 and actually there's no reason i actually don't have to write all these leading zeros so i also could have written pin b and 1 in this particular case 
and then we have an exclamation mark and this is a logical not. So this means that if this bit here is not set, then this whole expression will become true. And then we will enter this inner part here. I wait 100 milliseconds in order actually to debounce the, uh, in the, the, the button. So this is a kind of debouncing here, making sure that we are not disturbed by the switch actually going like this when we press it or when we release it. Um, normal mechanical switches have this property that they actually not make contact and at once but several times. Um, we have seen that on the oscilloscope in the previous lab already. So this is a kind of simple debouncing here. But what happens then is that I step up the counter I and I take this message here and put it into the output buffer using sprintf. Sprintf uh, we have used in the previous example as well. It allows us to format a message or a string with the inclusion of numeric variables in a certain, certain format. Percent %3u means that this variable i here will be formatted so that it takes up three, three digits or three character wide place in the string in unsigned therefore the u format and since this was a unsigned integer of eight bits this is actually yeah suitable slash r brings us back to the beginning of the row and slash n slash n gives us a new row on the screen and then i use the function uart put s which actually outputs this string to the uart and I will send the same string also via USB to our terminal program, a Terra term, for example, here, which is now not ticking anymore because I removed the clock chip. Um, so it will show up here as well. Then I will try to get a character from the UART. And this sentence here, this if sentence here, you are not no data um, becomes true when the UART actually has received data. And then we get into this inner loop here, which will take out all the data which the UART possibly has received until there's no more data to fetch from the UART. And uh, if there's no data, then we print out a small dot on the screen. And we wait 200 milliseconds and we return to the beginning of the while loop. And yeah, I hope, I'm not sure, I hope that it will compile. I see that the chat icon is highlighted. Um, position not set. Which position not set? I don't know, Samuel, what? what, what? Uh, and it's four minutes ago, so I don't know if this is still valid. Uh, position not set. Hmm, I don't know. Um, anyway, it compiled the code. And let's try to upload the code to the microcontroller. I will give you the view of the microcontrol while programming it. Not that you can see anything there, but uh, you can see me double clicking the reset button and I press program and code is programmed and let's see if there's something happening on TerraTerm and yes there is something happening um, up there you only see uh, the first dots and here comes the second row of dots. Uh, this is because this small view up here is truncated from the full window of Terraterm, uh, which I can show you barely over here. Um, so here you see all the dots coming, which means nothing is happening on the uh, on the UART. So and and this is what we expect because well, when should something happen? Something should happen when I press the white button here. And let's try to press the white button. 
Oh, it said sending message one, receiving message one. Sending message two, receiving message two. Sending message three, receiving message three. So if I now remove this white wire, which actually connected the receive to the transmit of our UART and press a button again, then we can only see that I sending message four, sending message five, but there's no one there to receive the message. Um, it's like me talking here. No, I hope that there's people over there receiving. Um, but with some feedback here, and I got feedback from Eric's smiling face. <laughs> um, so with the button here, we see that actually now the bits return back to the sender, um, but through the input, of course. Let us see if we can capture this on the oscilloscope. Um, I'm a bit... Oh yeah, 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 okay uh works but let me move this to the side over here and then let me choose the norm function there um i'll transfer you to view the oscilloscope screen again switching off the light Actually, I tried before summer to have three video cameras connected to my computer where one was constantly filming an oscilloscope screen, but that doesn't work. Uh, Windows, at least on my laptop, only supports two webcams. And uh, there's ways around it, I know. Uh, I just didn't have the time to check this. So, um, as you see, now you see a blank screen, but if I press the right button now, then you actually see that something happened here. And uh, I can do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Um, actually, the oscilloscope itself contains a decoder for, for all this uh, data as well. Uh, but it's better, I guess, for you to see this on the computer instead. And for that, we will switch back to my logic analyzer and uh, we get rid of the decoder for the uh, for the i2c i zoom fully out here uh, fully out so this this is one second worth of uh, collected data and i will press run and i will try to yeah i managed to uh, I will try to press the button uh, before it times out. And here we see the data now. And here we see the two channels. So we see the transmit data and the receive data. And since they are connected together, we of course see that it is exactly the same data on both channels. Um, so when we are sending a zero here, then we're receiving a zero. When we're sending a one, we receive a one as well. And, uh, but what does it mean? And where is the beginning? Where is where's the end? So this is now asynchronous transmission. Um, seeing this with our eyes, we probably can infer that this length here is this, the length of a single bit, because this is the shortest time which we see. Then we see blocks which appear to be twice as long, and we see blocks which this might be three or four times as long as the shortest um, bit but there is no real indication when something starts or stops. And uh, the only indication which we have is that here something happened. And this is the start condition for UART. It goes from a logical one to a logical zero. This is the start condition and the first bit transmitted is always a zero and then starts our data. So this is actually the first bit of the message, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. And Pulse View also includes a decoder for UART messages. So we have UART here and the red text here reads, there's no channels assigned to this decoder. Yes, uh, decoder, yes, of course it isn't. So we have receive on channel D0 and we have transmit on channel D1. 
and no we are not running at 115,200 we are actually running at 1200 bits per second and suddenly we see uh, that it actually this changed color here I will click away the menu and this is because now actually the decoder catches this is a start bit and this is data it, it is actually representing it as binary information and hexadecimal numbers but we are sending a text string wait a second let me center this a bit here we are sending a text string so 6d 6573736167 this sounds like a mystery to me um, but click here and we can actually choose data format from hex to ascii and now it says m e s s a g e message 35 so we intercepted message 35 on the uart bus so even in this middle here i mean how, how does it know that not this is the start bit but this is the start bit well it knows so because it counted the bits from the beginning and so this is the first start condition oh actually this wasn't this is a start condition here but why is it this and not this or this yes because it knows how we, we have eight bits of data a start bit and a stop bit and then comes the next start and stop bit and data um, in these packages so this is UART data transmission and uh, this is very widely used as I told you in the lecture for example now I would have to rig back the camera uh, this is a GPS decoder chip and they normally transmit data in in this format I cannot show you this I cannot show you this why can't I show you this I can try to rig up this chip um, just quickly and uh, because should be able to show you the data it cannot fetch a position in here because we are inside the building but oh no no okay yeah you you don't get travel thickness because you didn't see it um so we are here and what i will do now is i disconnect the usb here for a second and i will put this board up here and it tells me to actually connect uh, plus three volts to this pin and ground i don't have any black wires left so let's take a white ground goes here and uh, then we are actually only interested in the transmit data which is actually up here and so what i will do is i disconnect one of the two uart wires from our microcontroller and put it in here and we power it up again and see if we see something oh and i left this wire in this was perhaps a bit well i see something already um just looking at the oscilloscope i see that it's dancing and there's a lot of uh, ones and zeros coming in and this is coming from the gps receiver so inside there is a microcontroller itself it's actually a quite fast 32-bit microcontroller sitting in here so this is much more powerful than our um, avr microcontroller here but it has one dedicated task to actually decode satellite signals and uh, if i now try to capture this on over here i press run and we got something and it tried to decode something but actually it is trying to do so at the wrong bitrate so the decoder is still wait expecting data at uh, 1200 bits per second but actually we are getting data much faster than this i think it is 9600 and yes it is 
So it, it says actually dollar G P G G A and then comes numbers. And so this is actually the message from the um, UART here inside the GPS receiver. And one last thing which I will do now and try is to get this into our microcontroller by actually wiring the transmit data from the GPS receiver to the input of our UART on the 80 mega and setting the bit rate to to uh, 9600. So switch, switching you back here, we now want to have 9600 bits per second. I change the baud rate here. I will not change anything else in the code. And I have to look up again which one was the receive pin. Who remembers? I don't. Um, so the receive pin on our microcontroller was pin number D2. So we will move this here to D2. And uh, this will go over here as well. This doesn't sound too good. Okay. Um, D0, D1, D2. I must have... No? Ah! Um, yes, I assume TerraTam is fetching some very weird... Yeah, it's TerraTam. It's TerraTam making this noise. <laughs> because we are still running at the wrong bitrate. So... <laughs> there are actually characters in the ASCII alphabet which make noises. But now actually what you see here on the screen is the messages from the GPS receiver. Um, if it had a signal, you could actually write some code to actually get the information out of these uh, GP, GGA uh, messages, GPRM messages. There is a, um, there's some other messages as well. Every once per second, the, you, uh, the, the GPS receiver sends us some data over UART and we can read it into our microcontroller like this. And right now we are just sending it to the computer uh, to show it on TerraTurn, but we could actually analyze it inside our microcontroller and, for example, extract the information, which isn't there yet. The, the, uh, here, can, can I pause it? I don't know. Um, this would be a test for the scroll lock. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, but here where you see this row of commas, there actually you would normally see the position information if it had reception. And it's three minutes past five. And uh, yeah, uh, there wasn't more time than doing two of these experiments anyway. And we, well, we made two and a half actually. So now it's up to you to um, try out this code or variations of this code and uh, yeah, see what happens and uh, try to, wait a second, try to get time information out of the clock chip and possibly even set the time to a given value. Um, what, what you cannot really do is show the data on, on the computer or so. I don't know if, if some of you might actually have something which talks you out. Um, well, otherwise you can only talk to yourself. And uh, Samuel hasn't got uh, the hardware yet. It was sent to you uh, Wednesday or uh Wednesday or Thursday last week, but without any tracking information, it's sent with post nude from Sweden. I have no idea how long it normally takes, but I mean, my, I myself never get anything on Mondays um, here in Sweden. So uh, possibly it's in your mailbox tomorrow. 
And for everyone else, I will send out a message about that uh, everyone who hasn't got the, the kit yet and is in Uppsala, you can come by tomorrow or on Wednesday and I will tell you when and where you can find me for this. Most of you have got the hardware and uh, I hope you also get it to run on your different computers. Uh, I already got some feedback of problems but also of solved problems. So yes, uh, Guru has found a way to run it on macOS and uh, I hope he can disclose a little bit more in the discussion on uh, Studium on how to do it for everyone who hasn't managed it yet. With this, I stop the